Hey everybody, welcome to the program, WRSA Radio. I am your host, Grenadier One. Hope you're all doing well this week. Uh, I'm having a pretty good week. It's kind of a rainy day today for me, but uh, you know, we're making it through. Uh, I have a very special program today. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, get in touch with uh, Carl Dahl from uh, Gab and WRSA, if you've uh, seen him post over on the mothership and seen uh, Pete link to some of his articles and things that he's uh, he's written, uh, he's an author, uh, and uh, he contacted me. And we, we worked out a, a deal to do an interview, so I have that for you today. Uh, it's kind of a long interview, so the show's uh, longer than uh, than I normally have been putting out. So, uh, but uh, I, th- I think you'll enjoy it, uh, and, and I think it's worth. It's worth getting the entire interview in one episode rather than breaking it up into to two separate ones. So I so also kind of want to uh, apologize a little bit ahead of time for the audio quality uh, on, the, on the, the interview. Oddly enough, this is one of those situations where, you know, normally when you, when you hear an interview with somebody on a phone call, you'll hear like the presenter very clearly and the person on the call is a little muffled or, or metallic sounding or, you know, lower, lower quality. This one is a little bit reversed because when I did the interview, uh, I was actually on a speaker phone. And so when we recorded, I got uh, Carl's voice very clear uh, or much clearer than mine. So, uh, which is okay. Cause his, his responses and his, his words are, uh, a little bit more important than mine on this, so I wanted you, you to have, you know, the best quality for for his portion of the conversation. I did a little bit of a little bit of audio work on it to try to clean it up and and normalize it a little bit across the two, but uh, you know, maybe it turned out okay. I hope, uh, I hope so. At least at uh, good enough listenable quality. So uh, anyway, we will uh, we'll kick it off. So uh, without further ado, here's Carl. First off, thanks for coming. Uh, give us a little bit of your uh, your background and, and kind of tell us about yourself a little bit. Sure. So uh, I'm I'm just a guy. Uh, I don't claim to be a super soldier and a leader of men or anything like that. Um, I don't. I'm not a Navy SEAL with three thousand confirmed kills. Um, I'm I'm a student of better men living and dead. Uh, many of whom who have done this stuff. Um, others who are just scholars or they were peacetime military and, and pointed in, in a lot of the right directions. I've been involved in uh, gun rights and what you might call the liberty movement for quite a long time. I've uh, been a WRSA reader since pre-Obama era. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 2019, I, I published a novel that I wrote called Faction that was it's fictional and it's it's all theory and lawfully legal and all that, but it kind of talks, you know, a lot of the point was to talk about uh, the kinds of scenarios and uh, that, that are much more practical in, in terms of uh, stuff happening in the near future uh, versus a lot of the emphasis of that's really like light infantry emphasis that a, a lot of people in these circles focus on and I'm, I'm not poo-pooing light infantry or the guys that teach that stuff um it's just that's not the whole thing like patrolling your sector uh in in the in your little retreat area is important and and it is going to be more important as time goes by but that doesn't uh win things right that's defensive in nature it's reactive in nature and if you're reacting you're generally way behind the curve um so uh yeah I, i'm writing a, a prequel to faction based on the kind of fictional world that i created and the, and the characters in it uh which are based on some some folks uh that that i've known it's kind of uh potential versions uh, of people uh and that were right. involved in, you know, let's say, uh, uh, CIA adjacent uh, activities. Um, some were actual CIA paramilitaries uh, back in the day, and uh, another was a 
uh, a friend's grandfather who had been in the OSS and then was in the CIA. And I kind of riff on some of the stories around them and people around them um, just to talk about reality, because uh, I don't think there's enough of that. Um, uh, there's a there's a big focus in pretty much all cultural circles in the United States around, you know, fiction, like fictionalized versions of history, uh, television, movies. Uh, people will talk about something they've seen in a movie and it's like that has almost that's almost entirely propaganda or a romanticization of uh, things that it could be a little accurate, but most of them aren't very accurate. Like the 20th century was horrific for most right. of it, uh, not in the United States. The United States, it turned out pretty well, um, despite deteriorations uh, in the United States during the 20th century. But uh, a lot of really horrible stuff happened in the rest of the world, and uh, we don't take it seriously, and we don't think about, uh, you know, where we're going and what reality is going to be. Some of that's deliberate. Um, uh, think of the that John Mark guy who was a, a glow op um, uh, who attached himself to the whether or not he's a decent guy or not, I, I think someone who does a lot of government work and flits between Ukraine and the United States is probably not, not a good actor. But uh, Kurt Dingle, right. um, who uh, let him attach, let this glow op guy attach himself to his proprietarian thing, which is we could talk about if we felt like it, but I don't think it's relevant talking about niche uh, philosophy. Um, but that was a that was a whole operation to, to get people to 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 leverage people who are I think decent people and honest people that see problems in America and want it to work out for as many people as possible. Um, and get yeah, them I to think sign that's a, a document. Yeah, that, that says that, I want to commit felonies against the government. <laughs> yeah, right. That that's a problem. I think we we have we have a whole lot of people that you know I. I kind of lump them together and call them normies that are just in this this mode of of accepting anybody who it looks legit and and yeah. regardless of what they they offer up or what they propose and they they kind of latch on to them it's I, everybody's kind of looking for a leader and and looking for somebody to to, yes. to take them somewhere and and so any fool that comes along and is you know, half charismatic and 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 has something that sounds like a rational idea gets you know gets gets latched onto. Um, yeah, they, absolutely. They, they carry these uh, th these normies around like uh, like the the sharks with the little remoras hanging off of them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I could I could not agree with you more. Um, and you know, one of the things that I've always appreciated about WRSA and our good friend, Concerned American, who uh, has always very, very clearly pointed out uh, the ramifications of different kinds of activities that people were in. Uh, he was calling out, you know, I, I know uh, having talked to him a bit um, on the back end, I know that he, he uses tact and grace uh, in most scenarios uh, in the early stages, but if something isn't right, he will just tell everyone. Yep. And uh, that's been uh, a, a total lifesaver for a lot of people. Let's, hey, let's let's talk about it right now. Stuart Rhodes. Uh, right. Stuart Rhodes <laughs> created Oath Keepers, which was to leverage the 3% three you know, kind of movement, people who identify themselves with that. Uh, the vast majority of whom are great people and good faith people uh stuart rhodes is a, a fed essentially yep. uh yep. he and he has been called out for it like very aggressively and and the way everything has played out uh it's very obvious that, that that's what is going on there so we have to really think about this stuff and um you know the the article that i wrote that got us talking um was motivated by these observations that I have, uh, which is that, you know, people, like you said, we're looking for leaders, we're looking for movements, we're looking, we tend to, to think nationally, 
And um, I just am honestly, I don't think that that's a successful route. Um, it might be eventually um, communicating and continuing to network with people nationally and talk about what's going on is great, but local is where it's at. Local is the only way you can really build things. And, and a certain level of cooperative decentralization is probably the best place to start. Let people do their own things and have their own things, but find systems that work to organize um, for your small groups, uh, for, you know, for your family, for, uh, and that uh, really, that's the best angle is to look at like immediate family or like lifelong friends who are not compromised, um, instead of looking for someone to just show up and be like, Hey, that guy's doing something. And I know him from his name from the internet. So right. I'll go to this event. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that, although oddly enough, that is, that is how I, I, really got it's not how i met pete from from wrsa but but it was how he and i really got sure got together uh, I, I actually met him at a gun show which was kind of strange but uh uh so but then uh after that we we started going to some of the local protests and stuff that we were doing here in georgia and uh you know it just kind of went from there and he's a he's a good friend of mine now but uh you know yeah what you're saying of of acting local and, and pete posts that a lot you know local 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 he 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 really harps on that and i i, I couldn't exactly. agree more with you it, it's it's just you know the article you wrote and and laid out the the structure of these groups even way back then when you didn't have an internet and you didn't you know most people didn't know anyone really too far from their village you know back in the, even back in the 40s right so 30s Absolutely. So to to have so much emphasis placed on, uh, I, I think it was called they, they called it the secretary uh, and and oh, the right. vetting that 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 person does and and yeah. how they they build that cell structure. Uh, I, I think it's even more uh, of an emphasis today uh, than than it was back then. Yeah, and and we have to reorient ourselves with that kind of thinking. And and you actually made a really good point which is the big asterisk, the qualifier. There's always a qualifier, the Naxalt. <laughs> right, you know, right. I, I spoke in broad generalizations and said locals where it's at. Yes, there's gonna be national interaction. We now know people all over the country. A lot of us travel a lot. Um, right. That secretary type position, exactly as you're saying, there's like a, a, a leadership area or, or, or not a leadership area, a networker right it's a right. it's a role that people can play that will allow networking and it, and it's kind of a version of of what is talked about in the uh the cnt fai uh, defense cadres which i think we could just jump right into sure um, sure so i'd be i'd be happy to talk on and on and on about the spanish civil war um i've had to do an insane amount of reading on the subject in uh, English and Spanish uh, with lots of obscure material and really more academic or niche um, material. There's a lot of, there's a huge amount of anarchist material, which is where this article came out of um, because it, it's, it's really interesting, but in the English language, when you say Spanish Civil War, you have Ernest Hemingway, um, you have George Orwell, uh, who got what he deserved, but not enough of it. <laughs> and you have, um, you know, the the propaganda, uh, the the media propaganda that came out of there. Um, bad optics on the on the nationalist side, uh, not in the way that the not the correlation that people make now with the Germans, but uh, the traditional Spanish kind of landowner orientation that the, there's a press secretary for the nationalists who talked about how he just to make an example of people he lined up all of his workers um in, in you know his agricultural workers and they shot like seven of them and he was right. like just to just to let him know what was up i mean that's evil 
Uh, right. <laughs> I can't yeah, apologize you know, for that. Peter, but, Peter Kemp talks about meeting yeah. him in, in his yeah. first book. He had a had a run in with him or walked around with him. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great example. Uh, Peter Kemp, Mine War of Trouble, is a fantastic novel that has been um, republished recently by Mystery Grove Press. You can get it on Amazon. I'm pretty sure the only way you can get it is is on Amazon. I talked to uh, the dude who runs Mystery Grove uh, quite a bit, and uh, that is probably, my opinion, is the finest a uh, short introduction that you can get to understanding the nuances of the nationalist side because it's much more nuanced than than is as is presented you know um uh tactless wookie um who is a wrsa reader um, right. posted a, a great post today on um the you know the super secret flammenwerfer <laughs> club and um about the fact that he said you know what he he read the article that i wrote and he said i don't know that much about the spanish civil war uh he he watched a video series that i think it's a six-part series i think it was a joint bbc and um spanish television production in the 70s or 80s right and it would have been at the at the tail end of the franco era slash the beginning of their uh kind of socialist reorienting um and it's actually it's a very good series um and it talks fairly honestly about a lot of things but it is still um you're not going to get what you actually need to know uh because there's a narrative and it the the piece was kind of a, a truth and reconciliation, not in the um, not in the South African sense, which was completely anti-white, but it right. was it was about let's be honest about what actually happened. Um, and, and I mean, to be fair, they downplay the the actual legal steps that the that the franco administration underwent after the war um what they essentially did is they everyone that they captured who were fighting for the other side um after a certain point there, there were a lot of extra judicial killings at the beginning on both sides it really kicked off because um the the government was looking the other way as anarchists socialists and communists murdered people um, and in the first three months of, of uh, the the uprising, um, the the quote unquote Republicans, the the Spanish left, murdered ten thousand plus um, priests and lay people, and they destroyed one third of the churches in Spain. Right. That their right. goal was to completely eradicate Christianity from Spain. Uh, it was a full on Bolshevik revolution. Um, the anarchists wanted it to be a decentralized, like good vibe one, whatever that means. You know, it's <laughs> it's the it's the usual nonsense. Um, and the communists were just were handing they handed all the gold reserves that the country had over to the Soviet Union in exchange for uh, material support and advisors, quote unquote. A lot of those were literally just spies, um, and. Uh, they brought in international volunteers and those were that's where that you get the Ernest Hemingway connection and all the propaganda around about that but that was managed by the Comintern the Communist International it was a total Soviet project uh, and then they began uh, spending more time worrying about liquidating the um, the ideologically impure on the the left side uh, and killing, uh, you know, traditionalists, normal people, um, right wingers, et cetera, that were in their sphere of influence. They focused on the revolution, not the war. Um, right. The internationalists, uh, the international volunteers extended the war. Uh, it would have been over in 1936 in madrid had they not shown up and defended the city with frankly all they had they put up a hell of a good fight um so let's back it up a little bit because i'm talking about the spanish civil war but the point of this is what what lessons can we learn from it, right 
and uh, well, let me why stop you I... right there. Let me stop you yeah. right there. So, so sure. yeah, you, uh, Kemp mentions the the International Brigade prolonging the war and everything, and and one of the things that that struck me from reading his accounts, you know, um, and I see this this kind of replicated in even modern times in in places like the Ukraine and Syria, yes. is how untrained and how unskilled the people that are doing the fighting are yes uh, and, and the that's that's why to kind of go back to 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 what you were saying earlier about the, the the training and uh you know patrolling and all these kind of basic military skills it just seems to me that uh i don't i don't want to talk that t- up too much because i think you're you're absolutely right about the the need to focus on other areas as well, but but I think that you can't you can't undervalue that training either because absolutely absolutely it, there there's there's a there's a a phrase used to describe the the war between Iran and Iraq, which is ignorant armies. Yes, uh, and 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 I, that that really strikes me to apply to to a lot of these civil conflicts as well as just. You've got people with a lot of a lot of motivation and the tools, physical tools, but they don't have the mental tools to to, yes. to really make it work. And, and yes. you get you get a lot of a lot of extraneous violence and death that probably wouldn't need to happen if people knew what they were doing a little bit. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And and mm-hmm. I think I didn't I certainly like that's why I was trying to hedge my statement, which is to say that that the emphasis is on all the, the straight light infantry stuff. Right. Um, that's the amazing dilemma that you get in the situation, right? So let let's let's go from the start. Um, the CNT FAI was a uh, was a subgroup of the the CNT. Um, Union, which was a labor union, an anarchist labor union. Um, it's National Confederation of Labor, uh, and they were anarcho syndicalists, which is you know, it, it's important to understand how they operate, but it's really not that relevant. What it is is that um, they had a very specific perspective about the way society should be run. They were they were generally atheists. They were anti traditionalist, anti church. Um, and they wanted to overthrow the whole society, right? But they also were not Stalinists, and they they operated internationally a little bit at the highest levels. They communicated internationally, but they were not part of an international movement. They were not like Bolsheviks in that they wanted an, an international revolution. This was a Spanish um, or Iberian because they also included the um, Portuguese anarchists right. in in their in their group um but the it's it's an interesting structure so the cnt was the labor union that was millions of members and then the more militant more political people uh joined and were vetted and joined the fai which is the uh, iberian anarchist federation underneath it gotcha. so that's already a level of filtration you have a, an official organization the cnt which has membership lists and dues. Um, and then you have the FAI, which is a secret unofficial organization that still has like branding, memes, et cetera. And then after, um, there, there were numerous uprisings. Uh, Sp- Spanish history is insane. There were so many internal wars and civil wars in uh, the 19th century, and then in the 20th century, as they were kind of trying to figure out what they were going to do, were they going to be a republic, um, you know, that that was overthrown by, uh, through a military coup, and then they had a republic again after, uh, you know, they said, you know, basically collectively people were trying to vote, they were, they were trying to find a political solution to the, the problem of Spain. Which is very complicated. Uh, ideology doesn't explain Spain, um, <laughs> but anyway, ideology doesn't explain America either. Obviously, so, that's true. Yeah, that's so, very true. So what happened is that the CNT, the leadership of the union, who were revolutionaries, 
but they also worked with businesses and the government because they were official. Um, they ultimately said, you know what, here's what's going on. In the absence of preparation, there is no revolution. And this is from a meeting that they had in like uh, 33, 34. And they said, the more intense and shrewder the pe preparations, the more the revolution will prosper when the day comes. We must end the weakness for improvisation and hothead schemes as the only feasible solutions in difficult times. That mistake of trusting to the creative instincts of the masses has cost us very dearly. In other words, um, they they had been trying to do what you'll hear uh, from the Antifa types, which is, uh, we're, if we do X, Y, Z, the police will overreact, and the people will rise up, and they'll overthrow the government. It doesn't work that way. Right. Um, they had gotten wrecked in 1934 with uh, an Asturian miners um, strike that turned into a national strike which was very violent. There was a lot of street fighting from the right-wingers uh, just wanting to fight the anarchists and the communists. And so the CNT said, we need to put together an organization to actually prepare. And the only way we can do this, because this is an outlaw organization doing outlawed activities, is for it to be completely secret and decentralized. But there has to be a plan. There has to be uh, people overseeing this and directing it. And uh, so they put together a uh, this this defense cadre concept. And uh, in my article, I have a link to a couple hundred page translation of a great piece that a Spanish anarchist put together about these organizations. Um, very interesting information, the Spanish material and the translations of the Spanish material is where it's at um, mm -hmm. once you start diving in. So top level, you have a secretary reading between the lines. A secretary is a vetted uh, person within the CT FAI hierarchy, um, or even if he's a ground level guy, like say a union organizer, like a trusted guy that's totally dedicated to the cause. The secretary organizes cadres um, and he communicates and coordinates with the rest of the organization uh, via a secretary that he engages with and he creates multiple cadres. So if you'll recall, Matt Bracken had that uh, great piece many years ago. I think it was like Professor Raul X um, right. was the guy who was, who was finding vulnerable people to do X, Y, Z. It's a similar concept. You have someone whose job is to create these organizations. And that's where, to your point, the national type organization, I think, is, is where that would come into play, right? You would have right. people doing this theoretically, you know, 100 years ago in Spain, not in America. Two, um, each cadre has five core members that the secretary you know, leads essentially or directs. Um, one of them is a people investigator. And that's mm -hmm. the term that they had for this person. And they identify and register the names, addresses, ideological affiliations, personal details, habits, and danger of enemies within their precinct. So what, what this person would do is they would say, let's go high, low. We're going to look at military people, police, clergy, because again, they were anti-church, um, government officials, bourgeois, like wealthy people in their area, Marxist politicians, you know, their left opposition, uh, criminals, gunmen, fascists, which is the right wingers, etc. right? You have a person who just researches these people and puts rec records together and reports on them. Right. Makes uh, the list. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So instead of everyone making lists, they have one guy. And, and my interpretation of this from reading it is that everyone would be helping feed this information from their intelligence network to the people right. investigator, even if their their official job is something different. And everyone could help in operations with one another when they're checking things out. Uh, the next person that you have is a building investigator, and they learn everything about buildings in their zone. So you can think of this as uh, City level, 
uh, neighborhood level, small town level, county level, like it's all hierarchies. What I think you would focus on best bang for the buck, like most important things, and then go down from there so that you have a really detailed view of your whole area um, that you can provide to other people if you're doing joint operations theoretically or for your own operations uh, and to help flush out the information that other people in your cadre uh, are working on. Yeah, that's the that's that's an area study that that Culper talks about all the time, basically. Exactly. Exactly. So they would draw plans, identify features of buildings, find out residents, access points, structural strengths and vulnerabilities. Um, you know, are there where are weapons in our zone? Um, what are the police stations and jails like? Churches and monasteries, political and employers clubs, fortifications etc. And then you have another team member um, who is responsible for identifying strategic areas in the zone and developing plans and drills for street fighting tactics. And again, this is ever expanding bridges, underground passages, drains, sewers, houses with flat roofs. Again, that's very urban uh, mm -hmm. escape doors leading to different streets, fire escapes or inner courtyards. So you'll know how to get in and out of everywhere ultimately in in your in your zone and so if you were doing an operation think of how all these roles would focus in one specific area um the next person is the individual who's responsible for monitoring public works and services activity lighting water garages tram depots the metro transport routes their vulnerability to sabotage or seizure um that again this shows i you know, not only are you thinking of the structures of them, but who works there, what their patterns are, uh, you know, where their equipment is, et cetera. And then finally, you have a team member who sources money, weapons, and equipment. And again, in the United States, most people are coming equipped with basic stuff. Uh, in right. Spain, they had to do it from scratch. Um, but think of how a group of people pool, uh, pooling their money and standardizing can see those economic efficiencies, some others we can talk about. Um, because if you get six of a thing, you know, or five of a thing, because to me, the secretary is kind of, is kind of like uh, a guy who gets attached to your unit rather than being the core unit, you know, he would right. go on operations and stuff, but that's not his main job. He's a force multiplier. Uh, rather than the the operations guy, so right. the the that final team member locates and assesses the vulnerability of places from which arms, money, and supplies may be procured for the revolution, including armories, private homes of weapon owners, banks, loan offices, food and clothing warehouses, etc. They they could also be someone that, if you think about it, um, these groups would be financed um, through the CNT. Uh, back in the day, but in a, per my article, in a kind of free-for-all, um, you know, grassroots operation, you would be pooling money. So you would have dues, you would put together dues um, for your organization, and you would prioritize equipment acquisition because we're not anarchist criminals. Right. Um, so let's say every guy comes and has let's say you, you luck out and you have know, five guys with AR-15s and pistols and basic, you know, light infantry type equipment, web gear, uh, all, all the stuff. You would start saying, what do we need as a collective? Like, what's our priority of, of us collectively? Uh, radios, right? Um, we need uh, a secure system for... Uh, very, very focused and intentional, deliberate, careful, um, OPSEC oriented uh, internet communications or file management uh, for all the information that you're collecting, um, et cetera. Your dues could go to something like that instead of everyone buying something separately. Right. Um, you could say, oh, what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a 50. Right. Um, any anything along these lines. Um, 
the the general idea also is that you could also pool your money and have the person who's in charge of uh, getting equipment be the one who just spends his time finding it instead of what I'm sure we all do, uh, which is we spend a lot of time looking at cool gear that we want to get. Um, this way you could focus it and have one person who has a budget um, and he has a hierarchy of things and he shares them with the group before you just do go or no go for, for individual equipment, um, et cetera. So the other thing that the cadres would do is they would leverage their their trades and their skill sets to make their own equipment because in Spain uh, in the 20s and 30s they did not have the army surplus store they did not have um, right. you know online ordering of equipment um, you know weapons were more controlled you couldn't get web gear and stuff so what they would do is they would have people who were um, upholsters or you know leather workers or whatever make standardized gear and you can see this in photos from the war um, there's all these like white bandoliers for holding these uh ridiculously oversized hand grenades that they made that were called <laughs> fai bombs um and you'll see you'll see this as standard so what they did is these cadres would actually sit down and make this equipment um and and they used it for several years um, as as the war happened until they got completely suppressed in like 30 late 37 and were uh, militarized were, were forced into the the national army that was run by the communists right yeah and and I'm, I talked about the, the the funding and on one of my comments on gab and and yeah. you responded to that, to that and I, I yeah I, I certainly agree with you that we are further along here in the in the states of, of the individual fighter for lack of a better term is is much more uh equipped and, and better equipped than probably the 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 farmer in spain or the tradesman in spain so yeah uh, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with that My, when i when i talk about funding i think more i look at it from the standpoint of uh the more expensive gear the things that like nods and uh, oh, yeah. radios or or just some of these things that maybe not everybody in your group has or has the the discretionary funds to spend on is how do you you know if you got six guys and one guy has a pair of night vision devices whatever goggles monocle whatever how do you get the rest of those guys up to some equivalency uh, Absolutely. And, and yeah that's the i think we suffer from this this idea that if I share with my buddy, it's communism, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree with you. You know, uh, that's, that's something let, let, I think I, I even responded along the lines of, um, the, the guy with the huge NFA collection right. who lives in a small town. Um, we all know that guy and he loves his stuff and he'll let you run it at the range occasionally if you're not an idiot, which is, totally normal and such but when things get spicy um the expectation is that those people are going to uh essentially hand it over to the local militia to a certain degree and maybe they could be a quartermaster's guy and help with that and if they're in their 70s or eight you know even early 80s uh you know those people can train people if they're physically infirm and they're not fighters or they just don't have the spirit for it um, they can support, uh, they can be a support person and right. people like that will be invaluable. Uh, the guys with massive collections and huge stockpiles of ammunition, which we all, you know, try to do ourselves, um, their value in that could be a cent. And, and I know guys who are like this, who are like, when the time comes, you know, all my, my nephews and everyone else and sons who, who are the guys who will actually be defending the community, uh, they are handing that gear over to them. And so those that kind of mentality is really important to think about if you actually care about success, which is that if you have, you, you know, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. If right. you have if you have nine swords, um, you know, you're probably going to hand six or seven of them over to uh, 
young guys who, you know, the, the most capable guy in your group is going to be leading. Yeah, because you're probably going to hand it over one way or the other. You you fair. will. Yes. <laughs> to be truthful. Yes. So <laughs> I, I just so... I go back to the the example. There was a guy that showed up at the Bundy Ranch that that had you know the story came out. This guy shows up and he's got tens of thousands of rounds of ammo, and people were like. Hey, you're gonna you're gonna let me have some of that when the fighting starts, right? And he said, No. <laughs> well, why did you show up with all of that if you're not willing to hand it out to the guys that, that are gonna that's be there the guy, fighting with you? you know? That's the guy who's gonna be face down like yeah. in, on second three of anything happening because yeah, exactly. it, it's the, the private property is a wonderful concept. Um, I I love the concept. I'm not a communist or a socialist whatsoever. But the United States military uh, doesn't have individual ownership of equipment. You have right. you're responsible for your equipment, um, but it's it's issued and it's spread out to appropriate people uh, who are trained for it. And that's the way it is. You, you can't if you it, you know people do this thing where they talk about they do the well actually about philosophy and theory and say you'll you'll see these people who are uh on twitter and they're like libertarian party or republican party whose whole reason for being is to uh be the gatekeepers and the well actually guy to explain why it's conservative or libertarian um values to let the left win on something that they're going to absolutely crush you with. Uh, right. It's that we believe in limited government. No, you don't. What you're using that as an excuse to uh, wait, you know, wave away this loss because you're a controlled opposition. And if you're not controlled opposition, you're just a sucker. So uh, we have to stop thinking that way. Um, it, it doesn't mean, again, it goes back to your point earlier, which is people are looking for leaders. It doesn't mean a guy shows up and you just hand your gear over. That's ridiculous. Right, right, um, exactly. But the networking and the, the community is really what it's at, is, is if you're defending your community, um, you have to be part of the community. You have to engage with the community, and there's going to be a hierarchy. And maybe you're not going to be the top guy. Um, but what you're going to want to do is find a community or an expression of community in your area uh, where you have a place on the hierarchy that you're comfortable with, um, that is a good place for you, and where you can contribute. Uh, because if you don't work together, uh, you end up in a mass grave. Uh, the, the anarchists were great at terrorizing people. And this, again, goes back to your point about those military skills. They were great at terror. They were great at murder um, and destruction, but they would vote at the very small group level. They would have delegates uh, at the like 25 person level that would represent them, or one person doesn't agree, they wouldn't go on an operation or whatever. And uh, the communists uh, shot ridiculous oodles of them in the back of the head um <laughs> and the every everyone else got with the program and did whatever the communists said and they would just it was a meat grinder type military operations and uh that's that's really what happens whether we like it or not and we can you know you can talk about how that's a violation of the constitution as the bullet goes into the back of your head but uh it, it doesn't matter so yeah exactly Exactly. So, so let's uh kind of bring it up to to modern times a little bit. Uh, what are you you familiar with four G warfare and your position on that? Is, how does this kind of how does that kind of tie into what uh, what your article is about? You know, it's it's funny because um when you when you mentioned that as well as William S. Lynn's response. To Van Riper, uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. Van Riper, Van Ripper. Yeah. Either way, um, you know, William S. Lind is the guy on. Uh, well, he's one of the guys about fourth generation warfare, 
uh, maneuver warfare. Um, he's William S. Lind has written forwards to several of H. John Poole's books, which are about, yep. um, uh, you know, individual to small unit tactics, all the way scaling up maneuver warfare for, you know, fourth generation warfare, um, how little, little army beats big army, right? right. And uh, one of the things that, that Poole and Lind have been saying for years is that the Marine Corps has this official maneuver warfare, uh, you know, doctrine, and you read the book, but that's not what they actually do. Yep. And so, uh, you know, Van Ripper is saying, you know, fourth generation warfare can't beat total war. And it's like, okay, that's that's true, but who engages in total war? Where is there a war where there isn't media, where there isn't propaganda, where it's, you know, we're not lining up the red coats against the blue coats and shooting at each other, right? Like that that doesn't exist. So let's look at your successes, Van Ripper, in Afghanistan, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, it's I found it interesting that Van Ripper was the that's how they responded. He's the one that ran the the uh the war game where he attacked the the Navy carrier group with speedboats and and yep. you know that gets touted all the time about how terrible the US Navy is uh because he ripped them apart in a sort of classic 4G uh you know type style attack. I just yeah, found that it kind was of the 90s or the aughts if i remember yeah. Yeah. and you know and that but what happens i just think what happens is you get promoted and you just you're you're the the cheerleader for the org um and the and the org's doctrine and so yeah it's ridiculous and and obviously that's another thing to think about in in this realm which is uh, you know, the general rule is that phones stay home and you don't post about things on the Internet and X, Y, Z and OPSEC and all that. But if you look at stuff happening in the world, there's usually a media guy and a media group. Yep. And so when guys do operations, someone has a camera and they take it to people who turn it into propaganda. Right. Um, and that is a huge force multiplier there. It's great for morale. It's great for wrecking the morale of your enemies. Um, it's, you know, it's when, when uh, I mean, I know guys who, and I've seen other people talk about this in Afghanistan. Um, you know, people will post about it online, but I, I talked to a friend of mine who said that they came they came across some Taliban fighters and two of them had nods uh, and they, they had killed these guys and they were scared shitless because their thing was they thought they owned the night and they right. did um, in a lot of ways. But then there's this, um, you know, that footage that came out of Afghanistan. I think it was Afghanistan. It could have been somewhere else where um, the the snipers were picking off the um i think the afghan national army guys who were on the rooftop uh he, he used either thermals or night vision and um i think it was thermals and uh it's it was it went online and it scared the hell out of people because they're you know because it was showing what they could do that their their whole precepts as to how the world worked were, right. were thrown into terror so yeah absolutely fourth generation warfare is critical um you can't the you know they always say that um the victor writes history well you can write the narrative of a thing um and if that's what gets into people's minds that's the narrative regardless of what reality reality is uh the trial for the charlottesville unite the right uh is they're doing jury selection right now right um, for that uh that lawsuit which is in it's insane that this is allowed but essentially the group that's doing it is saying our purpose is to bankrupt everyone who's involved in it there's there's no actual uh you know damages that they're suing for they're just trying to wreck and expose yeah as much it's lawful yeah, exactly. 
but what what is the narrative the the narrative was written based on very coordinated and planned um like execution of what happened and then the state and the left created this is the tale of what happened there and that's what people believe uh if yeah. they didn't take the time to actually look into it themselves so that right there that's fourth generation warfare yeah you know last last summer i spent i spent the whole summer watching these live feeds of the riots happen. yeah every single night i you know you, you don't you don't watch mainstream entertainment because it's garbage but uh so so i'm watching these live streams and and you would get you would have nights where you'd have four or five different people out there streaming you know what was going on so it was it was an incredibly powerful tool to to show what was taking place and and it worked it, it didn't work in the favor you know blm and antifa and they became you know very opposed to it and and what's happened here recently is there's still riots going on there's still demonstrations oh, yeah. that are taking place but they're not allowing anyone to film it any of the Correct. live streamers that show up they run them off well now it's completely fallen off of the, the map nobody sees it so nobody cares about it uh, so exactly. so it's a dual-edged sword you know they 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 wanted to to kind of shut that down because they didn't have any control over it and it was showing them in a very negative light but by shutting it down now no one's watching at all so yep yep exactly exactly which is you know that's a huge mistake on their part uh so uh, i just we 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 often think i i i think of these these communist movements and these you know antifa and these guys as being very savvy and very capable of doing things and far ahead of us and i don't think that's the case i think that they're in a lot of ways kind of fumbling through through the the whole thing as well so oh absolutely you know um it, that again jives with the example of the spanish civil war which you pointed out which is that the whole reason that i put this this article out is that um the cnt mobilized 20,000 fighters in Barcelona. When the nationalists attempted their coup, the nationalists had a semi-coordinated coup um, across the country. Uh, they were able to secure some cities um, and not secure others. And this group um, that was organized over a couple of years of anarchist um, labor union radicals and, and revolutionaries secured Barcelona, um, and Barcelona was the last place to fall in the war. Um, so, you know, they were able to get people on the street, and, and what, did, what did that translate into? What did, what did the anarchists actually do? Well, they, they acted on their lists that they had. Um, they could go and fight against the army, but they also had their people going through the whole city after their targets and they completely wiped the right out of the the visible right out of barcelona for three right. years and and then when they get up to like the aragon front and it turns into like trench warfare um to your point they didn't have the military skills um the some of the the hardest guys the derudi column um were were these militant uh murderers they were basically a massacre team uh that would drive around and they they developed armored cars so they'd take trucks and put armor plates on them and they had some machine guns on them and um they they tried to go up and take these cities in other areas where that was more of the traditionalist zone where the the car lists had been organizing as well for a long time because the Carlists had had three wars against the Spanish central state in the 19th century. Um, right. And they had their own uh, militias and that was, they made up um, a huge part of the, um, of the domestic Spanish military at the beginning, uh, I should say nationalist fighters at the beginning of the war. Um, the, the kind of the, the army itself, the official army was, mixed uh going over to the nationalists mixed staying with um 
staying with the, the government and then the Army of Africa, which was uh, Franco's folks, um, that their core they were in Morocco and uh, the Spanish holdings over there, because that was a, a colony of Spain at the time. So they had to get to Spain uh, and then fight their way up. So um, it, it's, it's just, it's a really interesting thing. And, um, you know, in Madrid, uh, also, the while they were preparing to defend the city from the army that was coming after them, they also had those columns that were going through the city and targeting people. And they, I forget exactly how many, but they rounded up at least 15,000 people in Madrid. Um, and some major portion of them were executed within a two month period. Um, so it's, it's just it's having a plan and acting on it and that you know that gets to the point where is the is the military well let, let's let's step back if you look at your little town and for example and let's say 75 percent of the population is more or less on your side in terms of or can or can be worked with right like right I want to I want to emphasize that I think ideology is kind of a spook at a certain point. There's people that hate you and want to destroy you, and there's people that don't hate you and want to destroy you, right? Um, right? If they if they are in a certain orientation and they're an immediate family member, as we all know, we know family members who are Democrats who are reasonable people who aren't hateful. They're just they they have this imprinted on them. And a lot of those people are now saying, what the hell is going on? I don't understand this, right? Um, right. What, what is happening to this country? This isn't what I like. Um, those are people that regardless of their labels, you can probably deal with them on the individual level. Um, you should still keep an eye on them. There's also people that just openly hate you in an area, right? Um, the knowing who those people are, area studies, like you were saying, um, so that when things, when a crisis happens and it's time to move, you have to be ready to move. Uh, you have to be ready to defend yourself lawfully and legally and not violate laws, right? But you have to be ready. And the more prepared you are for that isn't just having stuff. It's having a plan and it's having people who can execute on a plan and you know having your priorities and you can very easily make an area where there is no toehold for your opposition without a massive effort on on their part in the future uh for example so like if a column is bearing down on you with twenty thousand men that's a different situation than having people still trying to fight for control of a town you know, because you didn't, you didn't have a plan, right? right. And you, do you try think to that's organize. The, do you think that's going to be a a big factor in in the coming conflict? Is, <clears throat> I mean, I I do I I think that this like settling of personal scores and 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 all those kind of things are going to really come into play, oh, yeah. and 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 these these very low level factional fights that take place in in towns i mean do you think that's going to be a a huge part of it or or is it do you think it's mostly going to be more of an urban and suburban conflict i think it is when when we talk about this the american civil war uh the framing was that it was brother against brother neighbor against neighbor and there were a lot of places where that was the case and there were places where it wasn't the case right, right. so i i my general perspective is that um yeah neighbor versus neighbor in a lot of places neighborhood versus neighborhood in other areas um a lot of it will will in many places it'll be race against race whether we like it or not right. we have to be honest um that's something that matt bracken's civil war cube is wonderful for um if you're in an area, the biggest thing, though, is the state against us. Like we we look at what's going on right now and it's just it's literally not open warfare at this moment, um, but it is war against us. Right. Um, Agreed, yeah. 
the the framing is that is well into that you know dehumanizing state um basically telling people they can't work they can't buy food they can't travel they can't use you know their health insurance they can't go to hospitals um so generally i think that you know we're pretty behind the eight ball at this point if people are talking about moving um like it's you better get moving <laughs> you, gotta, right. you better move if you're in a place where you're if you're not in a good spot i mean the way i look at it is you're better off in a state with a state government that isn't expressly hostile to you although there's no perfect governor or state government um you're gonna have to take a mix of the bad with the good um your own personal network is probably more important but if you're like in a if you have all your family in a neighborhood in a blue city and you don't know people in a in a rural areas like you're hosed mm -hmm. if something goes down like it's it's too late for that um moving by yourself to the middle of nowhere where you don't know anybody uh people who've actually done that i can i can <laughs> i can personally say uh if you don't know people there uh, there are a lot of places where you're not going to be accepted, like your children, your grandchildren might be accepted um, right. or you'll be accepted to a certain level, like you'll be tolerated in other places. You'll just be like right now there's people moving places and have California plates when they move in and they're a hamburger for the locals. If, when things right. go to get trouble, they're toast uh, right. unless they can prove unless they can prove that they're not an enemy. Um, you know, a lot of people now are moving to Arizona, Texas, and Florida. Uh, the thing I would point out is that there are wonderful places in those states. Um, if you know people there, all the better. Uh, they also have overtaxed utility systems and massive populations. Uh, water is a huge problem. Um, you, the average person cannot live in Phoenix without electricity. If your plan is based on living in the suburbs and having electricity and air conditioning, like that's not a plan. Um, I I honestly believe we are going into a horrific period that um, you know you're gonna have to you're gonna have to make some choices and there will be consequences to those choices and surviving. Don't not worrying about your investments, but like your children surviving is more important consideration than well, that's anything. an investment that's an investment of another type <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. so you know I, i'm a big big proponent of the idea that that we have to we have to slowly move these normies along into kind of where we are we're those of us who who are you know on gab and and reading wrsa and people who watch my show and and everything we're further down the path than yeah than most people and and we have to move them along it do you, any advice that you have for people out there on how to do that i would say pick your spots i would say find people that you already know personally like family members it's worth spending the effort very close friends is worth spending the effort neighbors it's worth spending the effort if you have enough in common and you have to be very careful uh the goal should not be to get them to agree ideologically with you about what happened 250 years ago or 150 years ago or 70 years ago um it it shouldn't be about anything along those lines it should be focused on uh is this a is this person trustworthy if this shit hits the fan um is this someone that i can rely on is this someone that i could include in my neighborhood watch group um is this someone i could have in a cadre kind of a situation um if it's not it's not worth the time um it's not worth the effort uh if you're if your grandmother or your aunt or your niece it, or your nephew 
have some ideas that you don't really like, but you know that you can trust them and you have like a, a loving relationship with them. Like, don't worry about trying to get to change their beliefs. Um, right. Don't worry about anything along those lines. Worry about whether or not you're, you're part of, you, you have a family relationship with them. Um, going online and arguing with people to try to get them to agree to something is the most retarded idea uh, that <laughs> I've never seen at work. What you can do is you can expose people to information and say, what do you think about that? You know, um, don't get upset about it. Don't get mad about it. Don't put a bunch of like emotional investment in it. Um, just really think about what's relevant and what, and what matters to you. Um, I, I have a thing where I have cousins that I will never talk politics with unless it's a very carefully crafted, um, communication because they have more of like a, a blue dog Democrat background, but they're right. also white people in a 95% white community. And they literally have no idea what it's like in other parts of the country. They, they are incapable of perceiving it. They watch TV, they watch sports, they have a narrative pumped into their heads. And if another person put it really well, he said, you're not arguing with them, you're arguing with the TV. Yeah, and you, exactly. can't argue, you can't argue with the TV. If you can point them to certain things that are in their wheelhouse that make them question it and, and help them decouple from those sorts of things, that's about all that you can hope for. And then you have something to work with. Like you can only work on things that are right, that are adjacent to their, to their sector and what they can understand. Um, there's something that comes from counseling and coaching, which is that you have to meet people where they're at. And if, uh, for example, you have an idea that's five stories up, you know, you're looking at a building and they're on the ground floor with you and you have an idea that is five stories away from them. They will not get there. But if right. you can point to something two ladder rungs up, like they can they can wrap their head around that. You can worry later as they move themselves because it kind of has to it has to be their idea. They have to convince yep. themselves because you can't convince them, but you can expose them to things if you do it in a way that does and get them to shut down when you engage with them. So that's what that's what I would say. Yeah, that, 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 that's good advice. It pretty much comports with how I think about it. I I believe in in the idea of of revealed truth of exactly you know, people people you you can teach some people things, but most people don't uh, really latch onto it unless they learn it themselves and, exactly. and they're actively seeking it. So exactly. Well, thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, I think it's been a fantastic interview, and I appreciate your time and, and effort today. So Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Hope, Great talking Hopefully with you. Uh, we'll have you back again, and, and uh, we can uh, keep going on. <laughs> That'd be awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good All one. Right. All right. So there we go. That's... Uh, that is Carl Dahl, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, want to say th thank you to him again uh, for for being gracious enough to do that uh, to do that interview. I really really appreciate it. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, give me your feedback. Uh, you know, like and subscribe on the channel. Uh, come see us over on Gab and the Mothership, and uh, I will see you next episode.